said that, but why not say it again? Still morning, right? Yeah. Morning, morning six, eleven, whatever it is, twenty-three. Uh, will you please open your Bibles up this morning to First Peter chapter one. First uh, Peter chapter one, and uh, we're going to do a quick review uh, for for two reasons. One, not everyone has been here the last two weeks as we as we have begun our series. And it would be worth your while, actually, I think, to catch up on our series. We're actually uh, looking at the biblical doctrine of separation. Of separation. And separation, uh, for those that would struggle with the definition or wonder, what, what are you talking about with separation? Well, it has to do uh, with understanding separation. It's usually understood by most people as Christians in the world and even uh, even. Uh, Christians who are trying to please God and Christians who are worldly. And how do we act and re react and interact with individuals uh, who don't love God or don't love Jesus? And uh, how do we respond toward people who are saved and people who are lost, who are ungodly? Uh, and at the surface, when we begin our series, we ask the question, is the word separation, is it a positive word or is it a negative word? In other words, if, if something causes us to not be able to be together with somebody, is separation positive or negative? And it seems, on the surface, it seems negative, actually. Matter of fact, there are Christians who, because they do not like what they perceive as the idea of biblical separation, they instantly just reject it, and they adopt a model or a culture uh, a church culture and a personal culture of rejecting biblical separation. And let me just explain to you or just give you a little bit of an idea of how that would actually translate or shake out in words and actions. It actually comes out in negative advertising. Negative advertising for churches. I have seen, and it's been a while actually, I guess I don't look very much anymore, but I have seen a lot of negativity in advertising churches. A lot of negativity in advertising churches. You say, Pastor, I don't know if I have or not. I have. I've seen ads that say something like this, such and such, name church, whatever buzzword is cool at the time. Hashtag church is our coolest, isn't it, Tosh? Hashtag church is, you know, that's the best name we could come up with for a hip church. All right. But anyway, I've, I, there's a lot of buzzy names and re renaming churches where they'll just call a church something. There's a church in, I drove by in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City, I think it's like Fight Church. Like, and they, it's like a UFC church where they fight and do, uh, you know, combat stuff. And some of you all are like, man, I'm leaving this church. <laughs> I'm going go to go to the fighting church or whatever. <laughs> but um, but here's, the, here's the negative advertising that I've heard. I've heard it said like this. Come to our church. We accept you as you are. Ever, anybody ever heard something like that? Yeah. Come to our church. We accept you as you are. You say, Pastor, that doesn't sound negative. Well, actually what it implies is negative. What it implies is that someone who doesn't accept you as, or that is that other churches don't accept you as you are. Right? In other words, if the distinctive of our church is, we're not like other churches. We accept you as you are. What we're saying is other churches don't accept you as you are. Sure. And that's really... It, it, it ticks me off, actually, when I see that. I'm just like, well, our church doesn't accept people as they are? Seriously? <laughs> Listen, who's ever come in this church house and we haven't been glad that they were here? We don't care how you dress. We don't care uh, what your background is. Honestly, that's, we, want you, we want people here. If somebody comes here, let me just tell you something. My heart is glad when somebody comes to our church. That's the way I feel. I'm glad you're here. And when I say I'm glad you're here, I am. I pray for people to come. And when they come, they're an answer to my prayer. So I'm glad about it. Okay, so that's negative, actually, isn't it? It, it, it implies positively, positivity. Defined that same statement, come to our church, we accept you as you are, it implies that other churches don't. Now you say, Pastor, but I know of churches where people are judgmental. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what? I do too. Uh, let me give you a, a for instance or an illustration. This has been quite a few years ago, but some years ago I went to a church when I was on vacation and I was visiting family and I went to the church and I didn't know how the people dressed at church. And you always feel less awkward when you're dressed up than when you're dressed down normally. At least that's, that's the way it is for me. 
So, you know, I always figure, well, you know, just kind of try to get a little middle ground of casual, casual dress. And so I wore like uh, basically what Frank's wearing with a tie. And uh, I, I, I put on a sports jacket. When I came in the door, they didn't greet me. They, a guy told me, he said, it's Wednesday night. We don't wear sports jackets here. You know, first thing the guy told me. And then I met another guy, and he, and he said, yeah, we all dress down on Wednesdays. We don't wear sports jackets. Or, you know, we don't, we don't dress up. We don't wear I, I must have made them feel awkward by wearing my sports jacket. But how do you think I felt? And then I met the pastor, and he said, hey, nice to meet you. Glad you're here. Oh, we don't wear sports jackets on Wednesday night. I felt terrible for wearing a, a suit coat on a Wednesday night. And I, and I wanted to say, and I think I might have, in our church, we don't judge people for what they wear. <laughs> Honestly. Because every one of them had a judgmental thought about me. They thought that I was judging them by what I was wearing, basically. Like, you, you think you've got to think you got to wear a sports jacket to go to church. No, I don't. No, I don't. I have a reason why I dress the way that I do. I have a reason why I do what I do. And it doesn't have anything to do with anybody else. It, I, I have personal reasons. And I, I, have, I have things that I prefer. And that's it. I don't care what you do. It doesn't bother me a bit. But you understand what I'm saying? In other words, people try to spend themselves as, you know, you've got you to dress up to go to that church. Well, to me, that's negative. Actually, when you say something like that, it's very disingenuous. Because what you're saying is, come to our church, you can come as you are, but you can't go there as you are. And you know, that isn't Christ-like at all, is it? For Christians to act like that toward each other. It isn't. It's just, it's not right. Uh, <laughs> I, I, here's one. Uh, the biggest church in town, people, I haven't heard in a while, but people used to say to me, we're Baptist, but we're just not Baptist you know, we, we're Baptists in doctrine, but we're not Baptist in name. And they would say, there are just things that we don't like about Baptists. Every time I tell somebody I'm from a Baptist church, the people the people from that church would say, you know, we're, we're, we're Baptist in what we believe, which wasn't true, but we're Baptist in what we believe. In other words, we believe in the doctrine. You're Baptist if you, if, because of doctrine, not because of denomination. It's not a denomination. Okay, but we're Baptist. And then they would say, but you know, you know, Baptists, whoa, Baptists are all about numbers. They're all about numbers. And uh, they're all about offerings. I mean, they're just, you know, and, and we're not like that. So I went on their website and checked their attendance from the week before. 22,000 something, whatever the time I checked it. I don't know what our attendance was last week. It's a lot less than 22,000, I'm pretty sure. But we're, the, Baptists are all about numbers. And I thought, come back with that. That's not my experience. In other words, that's negative, isn't it? Yeah. All about offering. Now listen, I've been in churches and made to feel very uncomfortable when the offering was taken. Have you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't I can't stand what hey, some people that are brethren of mine, I can't stand what they do with the offering. It it just to me it's embarrassing to be just not to put it any other way. To act as though God's people have to be beggars, like they have to beg. We don't have to beg for anything. We're royalty. We're children of the King. God provides our needs and He uses His people to do it. We'll tell someone what a, what a project or something is going on, but we don't ask anybody to give anything. We ask God to ask them to give whatever He wants them to give, and if they do that, that's between them and God. I've never known what any person in our church has ever given. Ever. I've never known. And I've, I've never counted the offering. I don't know what any of y'all give. I was told for our fence project that uh, some people, that, that a lot of our people participated in giving in the fence project. And that was encouraging to me. That's all I know. I don't know who gave. I don't know who gave what. But I just know a lot of people. I was told that uh, there was just a lot of participation by a lot of people, which is a healthy sign to me. It says, you know what, our people are involved. They're invested in our ministry. And so I, I, I felt great, but I don't know what anybody gave. I don't care what anybody gave. And I, I don't want to know. Don't tell me. If you tell me, you have your reward. I'll, I'll say, Lord bless you, brother, and then you'll have nothing in heaven. Okay, <laughs> that's all you'll get. Okay, so my point is this. If a church is saying, you know, well, they're all about money, they're all about numbers, that's negative, isn't it? How many of y'all like negative campaigning? Negative campaigning works, by the way. It does. Have you noticed how the politics in our country has continuously degenerated into just, it's just, I don't know, I don't want to, you know, it's, it's, it's like, uh, it's filthy. I mean, it's just, 
like to just the filth that's brought up and thrown out there and the, the garbage in politicking. It really is disgusting, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. We don't elect a candidate on the basis of their virtues or ethics or capabilities or their policies. We elect a candidate on the basis of which one's the worst. Yeah. You know, which one's the absolute worst. And then we try to take the, the worst of the evils. And uh, that's, that's terrible, isn't it? So the reality of it is is that the campaign that can throw the most dirt usually wins. The one that can, the, the best muds, I'm just, I'm just being honest. The, I, I remember the first time I just saw some really in the, just low down, you know, just low down campaign tactics, just throwing mud, throwing dirt on people. And I thought, that'll never work, man. You throw mud, you get dirty. But no, they got their opponent dirtier than them, and they didn't mind being dirty themselves. And so even if something was a lie and it came, came out as a lie later on, it already done enough damage, you know, and that sort of thing to candidates. That's just, that's just terrible, isn't it? And uh, that isn't what separation is about, my friend. Separation isn't. They're no good, and so I'm withdrawing myself. That's negative. Let me tell you something. As a believer, one of the most positive Bible doctrines you will ever encounter is the biblical doctrine of separation. Uh, we began in Isaiah chapter 6 a couple of weeks ago, and we looked at biblical separation on the basis of what Isaiah saw when he said that after, in the year that King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord high and lifted up. And the Bible says in Isaiah 6, his uh, train filled the temple, that is his presence, and in, in all of the... Uh, all of the angelic beings that were around him, literally his presence just filled the temple. By the way, that's what we ought to pray God for. I mean, literally, when the Bible says where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. We ought to say, God, fill this place up. Fill this place up so it's just full of you, full of of your presence. And that's the way the temple, the holy place where God was. And then we saw the seraphim that were around the temple and they had six wings. They had two wings that they covered their face with, two wings they covered their feet with, and two wings that they flew around. And they were flying around the throne and they were crying. They were screaming. I think of it like, a, like the cry of an eagle. And they were crying, Holy! 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 Is the Lord of hosts. And the Bible said when they cried that the pillars shook. The pillars. I mean, literally, can you imagine that? Being in a place where the cry, holy, 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 shakes the place. And then the Bible says it was filled with smoke. Like, this is not like a smoke machine, you know, where they start. I watched a, a service in a, in a church begin a couple weeks ago. I watched it online. And they started the smoke machine. They start the smoke machine like... 15 minutes before. Some of y'all have been to churches like that. I just never have. But uh, they start the smoke machine like 10 minutes or 5 minutes before the service starts. and just start. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about God's holy presence. It's literally got the place. Smoke is coming out of the temple. And when Isaiah saw that, his response, when he saw that, that's God. He's high and lifted up. His response was to cry, Woe is me! Oh, no. For I am undone. For I am a man, he said, of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Undone. You ever get just wobbly need? You know, you ever stand up at a wedding? You ever got married? <laughs> just kidding. Uh -huh. I have done weddings where men have passed out. Uh, and so... <laughs> You know, the, the, I am undone. I always uh, tell groomsmen, I say, it's always the guys, it's not the ladies. That, uh, you know, this is the thing that just killed, you know, it knocks them out. They can't handle it. But, uh, it, you know, you see a guy and he'll be standing there and all of a sudden he'll start getting pale and he'll start rocking or whatever. If I'm, if I'm doing the wedding, I'll just go over and unlock his knees for him. You know, say, unlock your knees, you're losing circulation, whatever. You're about to pass out. But the idea of, you know, you ever been like, so scared you collapse. I've scared people before. Not a, well, yeah, on purpose, but I didn't mean to scare them that badly. Uh, and I've scared people so bad they've fallen down. Like, just like, you know, hit the ground. Hit the, Anthony, I ever scared you bad enough to fall down? What happened to you yesterday? Why'd you fall down? Oh, your socks were slippery. Right? Okay, your socks were slippery. Okay. All right. So, anyway, but I've scared people before. Uh, I've scared people 
bad enough, they've, they've actually fallen down. You know, just shock them or surprise them or frighten them. You know, yes on purpose, but not meaning to scare them that badly, okay? Just a little bit, scare them a little bit, not that much. Okay, but here's the deal. Isaiah, Isaiah, when he saw the holy presence of God, he said, I'm undone. I mean, literally, I just see Isaiah collapsing on his face. Going, woe is me, I'm undone. A oh, man of unclean lips. God is holy, he's high and lifted up. I'm unclean, I'm low. And everything God is, is the exact opposite of who I am. And then he mentions his identity, which is where really practical separation and the understanding of it for our series comes in. He said, I dwell in the midst of a generation of unclean lips. In other words, he said, I'm unclean. He said, I'm just like everybody else. Listen to me, friend. Listen to me, will you please? Separation is not because you're better than somebody. Separation is not because you're better than somebody. You'll never separate from somebody because they're no good. You know what I'm talking about? You talk about, you know, you maybe maybe you're a kid. And, and by the way, parents, I'm not discouraging this. I'm just saying this way, the way you understand it. I don't want you hanging around him. He's no good. You ever say, had somebody? You, when he goes to jail, if you're with him, you're going too. And I've told teenagers that before. Uh, I, there was a teenager in, in uh, my youth group when I was first in the ministry. And he just... I mean, he had a burden for, for other teenagers, and he was always sharing the gospel with other teenagers. And he kept going over to his neighbor's house, and his neighbor was a, was a drug dealer, the kid was. He was in high school, he was a drug dealer, and everybody knew it. And I used to tell Johnson, I'd say, you stay away from him. He's no good. And, uh, you know, and Johnson, Johnson won him, <laughs> won his friend. He won him by biblical separation, actually. Uh, but he, you know, he just... I just thought, man, that kid will never get saved. That kid will never change. You stay away from him. When he gets arrested, if you're there, you're going to jail too. You know, that's the way I felt about it. But that isn't separation, actually. Separation isn't they're no good. You stay away from them because they're going to get you in trouble. That isn't separation at all. Isaiah said, they're terrible, and I'm identified with them. In other words, I'm terrible, and so are they. And my identity is with terrible people. I'm unclean, and everybody else that I'm identified with is unclean. Do you see that? Do you see it? The reality of it. So when we begin a series on biblical separation, first thing we see, understanding the teaching that the Bible teaches about separation, is that God's separated from us. He's high and lifted up, and we're wicked. He's holy, and we're wicked. You remember what what the angel, what the seraphim did? He went and took a, a coal from off the altar with tongs, and he touched Isaiah's lips. And, and then the Lord said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips. Cleansed you. You're clean. Look, you're clean now. And so, God took a man who was unclean and identified with unclean people, and God said, Now you're cleansed. Now you're clean. My friend, that's a picture of the cross of Jesus Christ. It's a picture of the fact that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and that the wages of sin, what we deserve because of our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Listen, there's no good people. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. I've had people try to say I'm a good person. My friend, no judge has ever judged someone for being good. Somebody's not going to kick down your door in the middle of the night and drag you off to jail and then bring you before a judge because you kept the speed limit or because you obeyed the laws because you did right. You don't get judged for doing right. You get judged for doing wrong. God doesn't judge your good works. He judges your evil. That's what a judge does. We're sinners. We've come short of the glory of God. And so, in God's holy character and nature, you and I are separated from Him. There's no way in the world we can have eternal life and be with God for eternity in our sin. So, this cleansing, this cleaning, is comes about by the cross, doesn't it? See, Jesus was God's perfect Son. He proved that He was God by the miracles that He did. And then He died for sin. Not His sin, but ours. And God made salvation a free gift. You can't clean yourself. You can't cleanse yourself. You can't attain holiness. You can't become holy. Or one time making a statement then and afterward just thinking about the words. I was, I was joking. I was joking about... Uh, going to a Bible study or something, I said, okay guys, let's go get holy. What a stupid thing to say. Can't get holy. Can't get holy. What are you, you going to do to get holy when you're unclean? Holy means without sin. Like God. There's no way. But you know what will? 
give you sanctification, or will make you holy? The blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus shed His innocent blood on the cross, and God made it a free gift, so that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And my friend, when you're saved, you're holy. And last week, that brings us to last week's message. Last week we looked at the call to holiness. See, when we've been created in Christ Jesus unto good works, we've been called to be holy. After Isaiah had been cleansed, after the cola touched his lips and his lips were cleansed, cleansed by the uh, by the coal from the from the altar, the Lord asked the question, "Who will go for us, and whom shall I send?" Remember that passage of scripture. A lot of people preach being called and so forth. They don't preach about separation from this passage about separation and who will go for us and then said I Isaiah says here am I send me now where was Isaiah sent to he was sent to that generation of people with unclean lips listen to me get this okay separation does not pull you out of the world separation sends you into the world now you don't go into the world and say we're just like you we're just the same as you are you can say, I was just like you. I was just the same as you are, but I've been cleansed. And my friend, that is the most positive message it can ever be. Listen, this world is full of people who are in despair, who have no hope, who don't have a reason to live, who don't know of anything uh, good or any, anything that they can do to be different than what they are, and they literally are stricken with guilty, unclean consciences, and they are trying to put on this facade of happiness. Listen, I, I, I've never been part of the club scene, but I have, I have tried to help people that are part of the club scene my whole life. And you know what clubs are full of? They're full of unhappy people looking happy. They're, just, they're full of people who literally are the most unhappy people in the world, and they're all trying to look happy. And they're all looking around at everybody else and going like, well, how can they be happy? Man, look how happy they are. Look how happy they are. And not a single one of them actually is. You pull them out of that and you, pull, you take them off of whatever they're on and every single one of them will say, I can hardly live. I can't stand myself. I can't stand my life. I'm the most unhappy person in the world and everybody else around me is happy, but I'm not. But you take someone who's been saved by the grace of God and been made holy, my friend, and have the joy of the Lord in them. And they've got something. They've got something that can't be lost. They've got something that can't be bought. And they've got something that they could go to the very same people with. And those people could say, man, you're different. Wish I was like you. Wish I was like you. See, my friend, this notion in Christianity that being like the world will win the world. It's a lie. It's a lie. Oh, it feels good to be validated sometimes, doesn't it? You know, when people do wrong, they want to get validated. You ever met a kid that steals that didn't want his friends to steal too? wants his friends to do it so he feels like they're the same as him. He don't want to feel like he's a thief and they're not. He wants them to be a thief. You know, uh, when people commit adultery, they want other people to commit adultery too. They want everybody to think that's just what everybody does. Somebody does drugs, they happy doing drugs by themselves? Is there any illegal substance, drugs, that are cheap? Any of them that are just free, don't cost money? I'm not, I'm not super, I'm a little educated, I'm not super educated on the on street prices of drugs. Because you know, drugs are kind of expensive. I couldn't afford them. Not that I want to. <laughs> couldn't afford them. You ever notice that, that people that do drugs want to give away free drugs? Hey, try this. It's free. Why do they do that? Well, drug dealers want to get you hooked, right? They want their pushers. They're trying to hook you. But why do your friends want you to do drugs? If you're just fine without doing drugs, why do your friends want you to do drugs? Why do they want you to drink? Why do they want you to smoke? Now, what smoker ever thinks that smoking's good? Right? Then they get addicted to it, they hate it, but they're always trying to get somebody else to smoke. Why is it? And, and again, I'm not, I'm not picking on any one thing in particular. Don't anybody feel like, oh, you know, I smoke, pastor's talking about me. I'm not. I, I, I don't have an opinion about it. God does. It's not me. It's not, not my thing. Okay? Why is it somebody does something and wants someone else to do it? They want to be validated, right? Or is they... But you know something? Being when you get somebody like you, you just brought them lower, right? You get somebody, you get somebody to do drugs. They don't do drugs, but you got them to do it. You get somebody to drink. They didn't drink before, but now, now they're drinking. You feel better about yourself, but then you feel terrible about what you've done to them, don't you? Why? 
because these things don't help. They don't, they don't give answers. They don't satisfy. Separation does. Separation does. I know probably thousands of people who because of Jesus Christ have gotten victory in their lives. I, 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 I just couldn't tell you how many people I know that struggle with something they could not have victory over and God gave them the victory. I know thousands of people who Christ has given the victory to. And you know something? Every time somebody says, you know, I used to struggle with that, but God gave me the victory. You know people that struggle with it go, huh? I can get help with that. You know, I used to, you know, I used to be depressed. I'll tell you, depression is is so pervasive right now in our country. I don't think our country's perhaps ever been, at least not for a long time, so far away from God as we are right now. And I don't think we've ever been as medicated. And I don't think we've ever put our hope in everything but God as much as we have now. But we, we have a depressed nation, don't we? But there's hope in Jesus. And my friend, separation is a person who has found help going to people who need help and saying, there's help. Now you tell me, is that positive or negative? <laughs> I learned long ago, and we're getting our text and, and look at some practical application from here in a minute ago. I want to tell you this. I learned long ago that it is silly for an adult who wants to work with teenagers to try to act like a teenager. Mr. Taj will tell you this is true. He works with youth. Listen, you, you don't, kids don't like an adult that tries to act like he's a kid. Honestly. You know, you, if you want to get disrespected like by a kid, act like a kid. You'll be on their level. And next thing you know, they'll disrespect you just like they disrespect your peers. The kids in our youth group, in our teen group, like me. And uh, they call me and ask me for help with spiritual things and so forth. But I never try to act like, hey, I'm, you know, hey, man, I'm cool. I'm a teenager. I'm, I'm not a teenager. I'm far removed from being a teenager. Matter of fact, it's this week I'll be 40 years old. Yeah. So, like, I'm more than double teenager, right? <laughs> teenager and <in> two. <laughs> um, gets worse. Gets worse? Being a teenager or being an adult? <laughs> I, I know what you mean, brother. It hurts to get old. It's painful. But the reality of it is is that teens don't respect you for acting like a teenager, do they? No. I see adults, I see youth guys, youth pastors, they want to work with youth. And so they dress, they try to figure out what the, the trendiest thing is, and they try to dress like a teenager. And teenagers look at them like, you're old, you look silly. You shouldn't <laughs> look like that. You're, you're, knock it off. Teenagers don't want you to look like them, do they? You know, Christians can be just as silly. They try to look like lost people. Lost people don't even want you to look like them. Do you know that? I found that out a long time ago. I remember being in a mechanic shop, working next to a guy that uh, was lost, and I was sharing the gospel with him. And I remember another Christian basically trying to show him that you know, Christians are just regular people. And they are just regular people, right? They're unclean people that have been cleansed. We're just regular people, and we listen to the same kind of music you do, and we do the same kind of stuff you do. And I remember him going to me and saying, Christians shouldn't live like that. He told me, the lost guy said, Christians shouldn't do that. Christians shouldn't live like that. He knew what a Christian should live like and act like, and it bothered him when one did. Now, will you ever be tested? Will somebody ever, you know, try to drop a bomb in front of you just to shock you? I've had people do that to me. I don't know how many times. It doesn't shock me. I know what sin is. I'm saved from it. And that's not, it's not, not going to shock me. You know, have you ever had somebody do something like that? Sure. But you know what they want? They want me to be real. And what I really am, my friend, is sanctified. What I really am is holy. What I really am is cleansed. And so I want to look today at a couple of verses uh, that just show... Biblical prep uh, separation. Uh, I had you turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, and I want to read verses 15 and 16, but then after that, uh, we're going to go right to Colossians, and we're just going to go through some of the general epistles. So you're in 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'm not. Verse 15, the Bible says, But he, as he which hath called you is holy, 
so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. I've asked this question practically a lot of times. The question is about the death of Jesus in my place and in yours. Okay, what am I? Say it. I'm a Patty. Well, you were. I'm a sinner, okay? What am I? I'm a sinner. She got the answer right. Congratulations. That was me. Okay. What am I? I'm a sinner. What is Jesus? Well, He's God's holy Son. He's, he is sinless. Okay. When Jesus died on the cross, did Jesus actually die on the cross? Was it actual? Did Jesus really come to the earth, was really born of a virgin, really lived a sinless life, really did miracles that proved He was God, and really go to the cross and really die for sin? The answer is, yeah, he actually did. Okay, was he actually dead? Yes. He died, yes. Okay. If our salvation is a substitution, that is, Jesus got my sin and died for it, am I actually dead? Am I? Yes. How much of my life did Jesus die for? Some of it? Part of it? He died for my whole life, right? I got the whole... Thing. Jesus gave His whole life for my whole life. And as far as God is concerned, my friend, I'm dead to sin. Jesus got what I am and I got what He is. I got His position as the Son of God, child of God. I got His position as, this, as sinless, as holy, as perfect. Okay. The Scripture says, this quoted saying, Be ye holy, for I am holy. In other words, if Jesus is holy, then my friend, you and I are commanded also to be holy. If you have the life of Christ and He has your death, then holiness is your calling. We saw that last week, practically speaking. We're commanded to be holy. My friend, separation is not negative. Being holy is impossible for a person that does not have the cross. Isn't it so? Listen, you can try it. You might have a good minute, but you'll fail at being holy until you come to holiness as the realization that holiness is not what I do. Holiness is what I am because of what I became when I got what Jesus is. That's the substitutionary atonement is what we call that. In other words, we substituted what I am for what Jesus is. Unholy, sinful, 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 sinful for sinless. So my call to be holy is because of what I am. Now that's liberating actually. It's liberating actually. It isn't because of what I've done. It isn't because of what I will do. It's because of what I am. My call to be holy is because of what I am. Last week we saw the call to holiness. Now let's go through some verses. Go to Colossians, will you please? If, uh, if you're in 1 Peter, it's going to be... Uh, right after the Gospels, just, um, Acts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. So Colossians. Colossians is not a complicated word. It's just the name of the people who lived in Colossae. The Apostle Paul was writing a letter to the church that was at Colossae. And let's look down to verse 13. Uh... The Bible says in verse 13 and about God, the Father, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Do you see separation here? Separation is, as it's said in other places in Scripture, we who were sometimes darkness. Okay, so separation is we're in darkness. And my friend, if there was a word to describe what people are in, it's darkness, isn't it? They walk in darkness and they know not at what they stumble. Literally, people think they're enlightened is the term that's used. And by enlightened, a lot of times what they think is, you know, we have a new perspective about sin. That is, sin isn't bad. We're enlightened about it. This is sort of related. Last week I read an article that Miami-Dade and Fort Lauder and Broward County have the highest percentage of annual cases of people contracting HIV and actually get it, it going to AIDS. In the United States, Miami-Dade 
and Broward County have the highest percentage. And I remember that that was true because the first time I've been from Kansas, my mom found out I was going to South Florida. She started researching and she's like, don't you know that like 33% of the city I was in at the time, 33% of the people there had HIV in the city. She was like frightened for me. I said, Mom, I don't have to worry about getting HIV. Not going to happen to me, you know. Uh, but, you know, really bothered. Well, you know what? Broward County and Miami-Dade have one of the highest per capita. And so I read an article. I was just reading an article. This came up in some news feed that I was looking at. And I read an article about it. And it said that there's a purple pill, I think it is, that uh, helps people with HIV and uh, it helps either to keep them from, from it, I don't know, I don't, I'm not really very well educated on it. And again, I'm not, I'm not, this is not a judgmental statement that I'm making here at all. But it said that they recommended for people uh, that were uh, in a homosexual relationship or for people who were in basically, they didn't say immoral relationship, but people who were living immorally, that they really needed to, you know, get screened and they needed to get on this drug. But they're enlightened. In other words, there's nothing wrong with this kind of a lifestyle. And it's not caused. Have you all read articles that say that the, that the AIDS virus is, is not propagated by, you know, that lifestyle? It's not caused by that? It's not that that, that, it's, that you better not say that it is politically incorrect to say that HIV is caused by an illicit lifestyle. And yet in the cities where you have a high cap per capita rate of that lifestyle, have free screening clinics on every corner. Go down to Wilton Manors and see how many signs are out to screen you for HIV. You know, Pastor, it's not very politically correct what you're saying. I, I'm just telling you it's the truth. And, and we have sacrificed common sense for political correctness for way too long. We're not going to do that in the church house. We want truth. And the fact of the matter is, is that sin is what God says it is, and the consequence, you say, oh, it's not the result of sin. Yes, it is. It doesn't mean that there aren't people that, have, that are innocent that have consequences. But sin is the, the consequences are the result of sin. Isn't it so? And it's okay to say so. And if we've had consequences, we can thank God for His grace, and we can thank God that people who are unholy can be made holy. We've got to understand our position. The Bible says we were called out of darkness. Translated from darkness into His light. Separation is the difference between walking in darkness and walking in light. Is that positive or negative? I think it's a pretty, I think it's a pretty positive thing. Isn't, isn't it amazing how the wicked one can spin things? How many of y'all ever been to a, an event that was televised? Whether it was political or something major happened? You know, ever, ever been to an event that was televised, like where the news documented it, and then they either interviewed you and put you on the news, or uh, where you know where you, they they uh, interviewed people? I have been to enough events that are televised to always ask the question when I leave. I wonder how this will be spun, because what actually happened and what you read on the news or what you see on the news, it's not even remotely close. Somehow they can take the same event, they can take the same people, and they can pull a snippet from a sentence, and they can spin it to tell the story they want to. Historians do the same thing. The revisionist historians in the United States of America do the very same thing. And isn't that what they say isn't completely untrue? Sometimes what they say is actually true. It's just what they choose to report. For instance... If there's one person in here who was hateful, bigoted, and angry, and someone wanted to, the liberal media wanted to interview someone from our church, they wouldn't interview someone that says we love God's, we love people, and we love everybody, and we welcome anybody from anywhere, and we'd love to reach. They're going to find the bigot, and they're going to interview him, and he's going to represent all of us, right? Like how many of y'all uh, realize that the news has identified the Phelps, Fred Phelps? from Topeka, Kansas with Independent Fundamental Baptist. Now when people look up Independent Fundamental Baptist, they get Fred Phelps, this guy with this, this you know, hideous looking daughter who screams curse words at people and she's just the meanest, nastiest person ever. And they say they're Independent Baptist. Their doctrine isn't Independent Baptist. They don't teach or preach anything, but that's how it's spun that way. Yeah, they're not anything. 
They're, they're, they're godless. They're not, they're not believers. They don't know God. The reality of it, though, is that how something is spun is how it's perceived, and the Satan is the master of that. It's amazing how you'll look at somebody who is holy, who God has made holy, and they're trying to live like they're holy, and you think, well, that guy never has any fun. You know, the opposite is actually true. The opposite is actually true. I remember talking to somebody that was in the clubbing lifestyle, and they were actually trying to get victory over it. And uh, they said, you know, I just, I just have a real hard time just thinking about being like you. <laughs> Made me feel really good about my life, you know. Just like, you don't have any fun. And I told him, I said, you know, I have a really hard time thinking that going to a place with a whole bunch of people and jumping up and down is fun. Like, I have a hard time seeing anything about anything fun about the club scene. And they so this person went on to detail, well, this is what's fun about it. And while they were detailing it, they're like, that really sounds dumb, doesn't it? A bunch of artificial people pretending to be something they aren't, acting in a way that is really <laughs> not okay, doing things that shouldn't be done, at the end of the day feeling terrible about it, that's fun. Not to me. I'd rather go fishing. I'd rather travel somewhere. I'd rather hang out with a bunch of guys from this church. We have fun. Trust me. I'd rather go on a trip with a bunch of people. I'd rather, and there's a lot of things you can do that are fun. I'd rather go to church. It's more fun. I mean, just to be honest with you, it's like the devil just spins things, and he, he's, the, he's great at just painting a masterstroke, but he's darkness, and he paints darkness as light, light as darkness. Okay, so we as believers are separated from darkness uh, and, and been translated into the kingdom of his Son. Go over to 1 Thessalonians. It's right after, uh, right after Colossians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7. We'll rattle through a few verses. The Bible says in verse 7 of 1 Thessalonians 4, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. You see that? So we're called to be uh, separated from uncleanness unto holiness. 2 Corinthians, it's, it's back uh, uh, just uh, a couple of pages in your Bible. If you go to the left, 2 Corinthians. And chapter 6, look at chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians. The Bible says in verse 17, Wherefore, speaking of, of those people that, that are darkness in verse 14, it says, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters. We're called to be separated. Do you see the call to separation? Separation is twofold. Separation is coming out from, and separation is going towards something. Separation is from the wicked, and separation is to God. What are we naturally? We're naturally separated from God and identified with the wicked. But when we are separated the Bible way, we're separated from the wicked and unto God, and then we saw that we're sent to the wicked. Sent to the wicked is separated. Listen, Christians, we, we should not withdraw ourselves. Listen, you are the voice of reason. And people need it. I, I, there are a lot more verses, and I can give you a list of them, uh, but I think, I think we've, we've made our point about that this morning. I want to uh, finish with just this story, and I've told it in our church before, but I've realized this a long time ago, that people are actually looking for someone to just state the obvious a lot of times, or just say something that makes common sense. Two years ago, when we were closing out our storage unit here because we built our shed out back, I was over across the street at the public storage place, and I was waiting in line, and on the news, this is when that terrorist had... Uh, crashed a Russian jet. Terrorist pilot had on purpose wrecked a Russian plane. And on the news, they said it was it was you know the guilt by association thing. They said that they had done research and they found out that his cousin was uh, was a member of ISIS. So they're just trying to figure out what happened on the jet. You know, did the did the the pilot pass out? Why did the jet crash? And they said that his cousin was the member of ISIS. And I spoke up there and I said, I said, you know, that's guilt by association. Just because his cousin was a member of ISIS and he's a Muslim does not mean that that was an act of terrorism. And everybody said, yeah. And then I turned around and looked at everybody and I said, really? <laughs> really? I said, it absolutely was an act of terrorism. And they're, they can't even say it because they're too politically correct. And everybody's like, yeah. That's right, it was. <laughs> you know me, I'm shy. 
I said, really? And everybody's like, yeah. You know, people just want someone to say it. We just, we just don't say that. And some people just want somebody to just to state the obvious. Just, yeah, it's what it was. Yeah, evidently. Hey, folks, I've read the Hadiths. I've read most of the Quran. And um, Muhammad's a pedophile. And uh, yeah, he is. He's a pedophile. And Muslims are pedophiles. And homosexuals. And immoral. You say, Pastor, you should not say that. Well, then you read the Hadiths and Korans and Quran and tell me what it means. It's true. But we can't say that. Stop. We can't say that. <laughs> and friend, it's like we just check our brains out. Just, and we need as believers to actually be the kind of people, not obnoxious. Listen, I'm not going to go stand in front of a mosque and say, you know, Muhammad was a pedophile. Tony said that to a Muslim guy one time, but I wouldn't do that. Okay. I know what it was. Tony was asking, how did, why did uh, Muhammad marry an eight-year-old girl? And his friend said, well, you know what we call that, in, in, and there's a word for that. And, and Tony said, pedophile? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> told the guy. So Tony would say that. Uh, and actually, the guy stopped being a Muslim not very long after that. Uh, he became a Christian. Uh, not, not very, but you know, just call things what they are. You know, HIV is not helping anybody, folks. Immorality is not helping anybody. The, the way the world thinks isn't helping. The world's lost. We have the highest suicide rates we've ever had, especially with teenagers. We have the highest drug rates. We have, our country has said we have an opioid crisis. Did anybody know that? Yes. Yeah. We have an opioid crisis in our country. Mm -hmm. But don't you dare say that people are drug addicts or that, that, that drugs are a problem or that they're, don't dare, whoa, 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 whoa. You know what? The world needs some help. Listen, I know how to get off of opioids. I know how to, yeah, Jesus. I know how to help people with that. Everybody else just says, well, you know, you're normal. It's okay. It's from, until they kill themselves because they know they're not okay. They know they're living a lie. My friend, we need some holy Christians, separated Christians. We need some Christians that aren't drunkards, that aren't drug addicts, that aren't immoral, that are living like, like in a way that reflects Jesus, that have joy, that have peace, that have God's love. We need them to reach out and say, we can help you. We can help you. Yeah, some of the things that we're going to say because they're true, they're going to have to make you deal with reality. You're going to have to be honest. You're going to have to be real about what sin is. But you can be holy. And I'm not holy because I'm good. I'm not holy because I'm intelligent. I'm not holy because I'm better than anyone else. I'm holy because God made me to be. And anybody can have God make them holy. Isn't that wonderful? Salvation is a free gift and holiness is a result of it. And we as believers ought to embrace separation. We ought to look at the world and say, how can I be in the world and not of the world? How can I do it? Because I want to be able to offer hope. There's no help in unity with unrighteousness. But there's help in separation. My friend, I'm learning that separation is one of the most positive words there can possibly be because we can help people that are beyond help. Father, thank You so much for Jesus. Thank You for the truth that we've heard this morning. And I pray that You would just impress and burn it into our minds. God, in many ways, in many ways, we as worms, we as lowly, unclean men, have stood in judgment of You. Lord, the church is guilty. The church is guilty of not only being unholy, but the church is guilty of judging Your holiness and saying that the truth of our being separated from unrighteousness and from darkness and from uncleanness, that You're not good because of it. Or that's not a good way to preach Jesus. Yet God, we need separation. We need to be what we've been made to be in Christ Jesus. And I pray that You would help us to practically live what we've learned this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we dismiss here in just a moment, let me just uh, mention one thing that...
I would hate to end our service without mentioning. And that is about, a lot of times normally we have an invitation at the end of our service. And I haven't felt led to have an invitation at the end of our service. We're going to have an, uh, an invitation at the end of our series. But there's always an invitation. God is inviting you, my friend. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, God's invited you. He's inviting you to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. We're here for that. You don't need to go forward to, to uh, receive Christ as your Savior. That's something between you and God. And we can help you. If you've got questions about that or you're unclear about the Gospel and the simplicity of the Gospel, I've got a Bible and I can answer any of your questions. Not because I know everything, but, but, but the Bible does have all the answers. It really does. I answer any questions you have. And I've got the time for it. So we don't close... We close our services, but we don't close an invitation. The invitation is always open. You may have come today with someone who loves you. If someone brought you here, it's probably because they love you. And so they can help you. Uh, have those conversations on the way home. Ask the person who loved you enough to invite you to come to a place where you'd hear the gospel preached. And ask them about it. And they'll help you. They'll help you with it. And uh, we'll help you with anything that we can. You say, Pastor, you know, you talked about something that was personal to me today. Um, well, that wasn't by intention, but it was. In other words, I want God to use me to help you in your life. You need help with something, my friend. I am, I am available to you. Uh, folks that know me know I answer my phone. You call my phone, uh, I'll answer it. Stop by if you can find me. Uh, and I've got time for you, I really do. And I will do my very best to be able to help you, be available for you. If you're a lady, my wife's always available. If you're a gentleman, I'm always available, and I'd love to be of a help to you throughout this week. I hope you have a great Father's Day, amen. I, if you like to have your feet tickled, I hope you enjoy that a lot. And uh, just, just have yourself a great day. And uh, it's a wonderful day that we celebrate the resurrection. Uh, you go in peace and be dismissed. God bless you. Amen.